Does anyone have uh, some essential question before we before we do begin today? Hello, Cardia. Have you, is this your first time joining uh, Cardia? No, it's not my first time here. How many times have you joined us, joined for meditation? Maybe twice. Maybe two times, okay. And how about how many times have you practiced meditation? I try to do it every night before yeah. sleeping. How do you how do you do that exactly? What's your what's your process before sleeping to meditate? I like to lay down, relax, and try to be calm. You focus on the breath or the feeling of your body? The feeling of my, bo my body. Great. Sounds like a good a good way to end the day. Yes. Hello, Julie. You're right on time. Just take uh, three more minutes before we start. How about you, Julie? Is this your first time joining? All right, it's a mystery. Hello, Gypsy Moth. A lot of people here who I don't know so much. Gypsy Moth, are you there? Cardia? Can you speak? Wow. Is this your first time joining, Gypsy? Yes. Great. Glad that you're here. You're right on time. I knew some gypsies in Italy that were very nice. So I'm happy to have a gypsy moth here now. Yeah. Okay, so let's start today with uh, our session today with first, uh, just in general, recognizing where we are. So where our body is and where our mind is, kind of checking in to the situation that is happening right now. And recognizing that this is what's happening right now. We're not in another place. We're not in another time. We're not in the past. We're not in the future. Uh, but we are here in the present, uh, gathering together to meditate, to turn inward, to relax, to fully be here.
Recognizing that, we can bring up an intention. So what is your intention in being here? You know, why, why are you showing up to meditate? Why aren't you on TikTok? You know, why are you coming here? So we can ask that question and find a sincere um, answer to that. Not so complicated, but find our sincerity in, uh, in being here, our intention in showing up to meditate. And that intention might not even be a, a kind of thought or, or a story. It might be more of a feeling. So whatever intention you find, uh, go ahead and take a deep breath and bring that intentionality, bring that sincerity to be here at this moment. Breathing in deeply, bring that intention home to the body. Bring the mind home to the body. And that doesn't mean much more than we breathe in deeply and we feel our awareness, our presence in the body. We become more aware of our body being here and that there's a sincerity and an intentionality in the body being here at this moment. making sure that we are comfortable, can start to notice that even with this kind of more intensive awareness, like we're really present and there's a sense of energy to what we're doing right now, even with all that energy, maybe usually we associate that with motion, with doing, with some activity, but now that awareness, that presence, uh, we can start to notice the stillness of the body right now. The mind and body uh, being together at this moment. And opening ourselves up, hopefully, to a sense of peace and relaxation. If we don't feel that, at least to feel uh, a sense of sincerity and wholesomeness in just being here right now, in showing up to what's happening gently. Taking a few deep breaths, really letting the mind settle into the body, letting the body relax more and more into stillness, into a state of calm. A state of being and noticing rather than doing. Letting the body kind of sit here still, maybe scratching an itch. Let the body breathing. Let the body do what it's doing right now with much interference or involvement or judgment or overthinking. But just letting the body be the body right now. Allow the breath to happen in a comfortable, natural way. Allow the mind to be the mind without 
judging it or trying to control it. But simply facing what's happening. Being with the body, the breath, the mind. Relaxing and releasing any second mindedness that is to just fully be with what's happening without adding on to it, without trying to change it. Just sitting, just breathing and being aware. Letting your whole body and mind do nothing more than sink into this present moment, into just being here without judgment or control or second thought. We don't want to bring up too much force or tension, but there is a quality of curiosity that is really valuable in this practice. What's more interesting? What's more odd than this body, this mind, this reality right now? It's really something that easily inspires curiosity if we kind of take a look, if we're really willing to be with what's actually happening rather than our judgments about it, our perceptions, our story about it. So instead of our normal way of being, fully and completely putting the body down, sitting or laying down, whatever position, the body becoming somewhat still, somewhat stable. We're not getting rid of the mind, we're not trying to control the mind, but we we kind of disentangle ourselves from involvement with the mind, with thinking. So we use our mind focus or mental faculty to just breathe, to be aware, to notice, and really to look at what's happening right now rather than chasing around thought after thought. 
but really to look at this curious, interesting situation of the body just sitting here, somewhat still, the breath flowing in and flowing out, and simply being aware. giving our full attention to this moment. And when we get distracted, when we encounter difficulties, Don't let the train of your sincerity, your mindfulness, your curiosity be completely derailed, thrown off the track. There's a little bit of a wibble, there's a little bit of a wobble, a wiggle and a woggle. And then we just come back. We come back to that balance point. The body is really sitting here right now. The breath is really flowing in and flowing out. And we are aware, we're present to everything that's happening. Just breathing and being aware. This is just completely precious, completely essential, completely the center of our lives right now. Enjoy to be here at the center of your life. Enjoy the breath, enjoy the awareness of the body. Just sitting, just breathing, just being aware.
whatever thoughts or distractions come up. It's just like a friend reminding you to step back into peace and awareness and presence. It's just a reminder, nothing to get involved with or confused about. It's just a thought, sleepiness, tension. It's all just a reminder to return to just breathing, feeling the, feeling the breath closely and intimately as it flows in and flows out. If even for one moment we weren't able to continue breathing, the whole world would fall apart. And yet we so often treat, consider the breath to be pointless, boring, not so interesting. So really look into that. This amazing, precious, essential breath that we so often neglect and forget about. How fully can you be with that? And how interesting and curious it is that each and every breath is continuing our life. continuously allowing this body and mind to function, to be healthy, to be alive. Follow the breath and feel the breath in all its brilliance, its preciousness. Look closely and enjoy just breathing and being aware. If there is a tension, physically or mentally, relax it, let it go. And if you can't relax it, if you can't let it go, just don't worry about it. It's completely temporary. Just be patient. Just breathe and be aware.
Sometimes we like things. Sometimes we don't like things. Sometimes we are in a state of desire. Sometimes we are in a state of not wanting or fear. Our preferences, our likes and dislikes are not so important. Not to be taken so seriously, not to be believed in, not to be chased after, not to be involved with. It's just to be aware at this moment. It's just to refresh, restart, become aware of the body. Become aware of this precious, life-giving breath. Don't worry about how you're breathing. Don't judge it. Don't try to control it. You're alive. Just be grateful. Just appreciate whatever breath you can take. Enjoy and appreciate each and every breath. the body becoming more and more still, the mind becoming more and more simple. That is, we're just sitting, we're just breathing, we're just being aware. If you feel hot and uncomfortable, enjoy, appreciate 
a feeling of being hot and uncomfortable. Don't fight with anything. So at this moment, we can open our eyes if they're closed and do a little bit of a self-massage. You can massage your face and your head. It's important that when we are practicing, um, you know, we don't always have the, the causes and conditions, the good causes and conditions come together to support us to meditate. So sometimes when, those, when that situation happens, we, we should take advantage of it. You know, we, we should practice. We should do our best to, to practice. But it's important that we never get into a fight. We're not struggling to meditate. We're not fighting to meditate. So if you find that in your meditation, you're really not touching any place of peace, then it's a time to just practice gentleness and softness and caring and compassion. Maybe use your thoughts to to do metta. You know, may I be happy, may I be peaceful. We, we're not going to grit our teeth and get through this. You know, gritting our teeth is what we're doing most of the time. You know, that's what we have to do when we go to work or when we go on a trip or wh- whatever, where there's a a really strange, difficult situation that we have to endure and not make a mess of. But meditation's not like that. Meditation is really the time for us to show up and touch peace. And if we can't touch peace, then we should use our thoughts in a in a very sweet, gentle, caring, and compassionate way. So practice metta or or you know, whatever you do, just don't make meditation a time to fight with yourself or to struggle. And if you do find that that's what's happening, do it in a gentle way. Don't take yourself so seriously. So I wanted to read some Zen words. Zen is one of the um, you know, kind of like the the deepest ways of approaching Buddhism and the Buddhist truth, Buddhist ideas is is the what Zen focuses on. And so there's, in general, as a modern people, you know, we want the juiciest fruit. We want the best, the highest level that we can get our hands on. Um, but in the Tibetan tradition, for example, which also has like a Zen perspective at the at the top echelon of it, you have to do all kinds of different things before you start to hear Zen teachings. So you will have to do 10,000 prostrations, you know, 10,000 bows, or you'll have to, I don't know, walk around a mountain, or you'll have to 
to repeat this mantra one million times or something like that. You you have to kind of confront, you have to go through these barriers of developing your um, your goodness and then your concentration. And then you have more of a capacity to understand things in a wise way, just in general. But even beyond that, because of the the kind of like deep wisdom approach that Zen takes in the way that it expresses wisdom, some of the things are just really inaccessible. Even, you know, for me, I, I have a tough time understanding them. Part of that might be translation, might be this, might be that, but there can be a lot of confusion that comes up in um, trying to understand Zen, and there's so many different ways of approaching it. But what Zen teachings can always be uh, helpful for is bringing us into this state of not knowing. You know, there's uh, there's certainly a, a sincerity and a directness in Zen teachings in general, and they're coming from, you know, uh, monks from a thousand plus years ago. So it's not like they're trying to get that get you to sign up for their their patreon or join a cult or something you know their 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 mindset is coming from a very different place so there's not there's not much issues that you need to have by like oh now you're in a state of not knowing or you've lost your your foundation of knowing or of understanding and now you know you find yourself wearing purple and orange robes a, a few years down the line or who you know who knows what that's not really a danger it's um that you'll that you'll face. It's more you have this opportunity to be in a state of of not knowing, a state of intimacy with the ground of all reality. You know the ground of truth, which is this. You know this is the ground of truth. You're not going to find truth at any other place at any other time. You're not even going to find a Twinkie or an Oreo at any other time. How much how much less so the the ground the truth of all being of all reality. Right? Can't even drink water at another time. So let's see. Uh, all right, this uh, this looks like a nice one. So so me uh, in the in the style that I practice um, meditation and and giving a teaching or giving a talk. And really, since I was a, a young person, you know, I don't want to do my homework. I don't want to prepare for anything. I want to face what is happening right now. I want to be prepared through my sincerity. And luckily, you know, I, I, I worked myself into situations where meditating was doing the homework and being around people who were more experienced than me was doing the homework. And I continue to do that, but like preparing talks or preparing, you know, I can barely study for myself, let alone study to prepare for other people to, you know, to study or to do a workshop or whatever. So when when we have these events and I want to share Zen teachings, I oftentimes have to look quickly and kind of see, is this something that I think is going to be digestible in um, in this environment at this time? And it's not always perfect, uh, but at least if you don't understand, you can be with not understanding. You can be with not knowing. You can be in this state of intimacy. Um, but not in a powerless way, in an intimate way, in like you're really there. You don't know, you don't understand, but you're really there with not understanding. You're not easily misled. You're not easily brought to, okay, you don't understand and now you need to buy this crystal because that's what's going to do it for you. No, you don't know about that crystal either. You don't know about anything. You only, there's this, only this knowing and you being there and showing up. That's what you know. You, you're aware. But don't even worry about that kind of knowing. So this is a letter, a Zen letter uh, from, you know, somewhere in ancient China, many hundreds and hundreds of years ago that was written in Chinese and translated to modern English. And this was a letter written to fundraiser Zhang. So as a monk, you know, we we forego the 
the practice of developing material wealth. And so in that way, there's a lot of relationships that are based on that. So if you're not in the business of developing material wealth, well, where are you going to sleep? Who's going to pay for the temple? Uh, who's going to feed you? You know, how are all these things going to be taken care of if you have renounced developing material wealth? And in the time of the Buddha, you know, that was that was stone cold, homeless, destitute, wandering uh, person in patched robe monks, you know, that hadn't showered in, in weeks and months. And they just survived from the, the food that was put in the bowl for them. But in the modern time, you know, there's, and as Buddhism progressed, people more and more wanted to be involved with supporting the monks and setting up temples and setting up organizations. But that relationship between monks and their supporters is very much based on this practical, um, this practical exchange or uh, way of relationship where lay people are, 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 basically working to support the monks materially and manage their material situation. So that's how the, the lay people are able to engage with monks in a empowered and independent way from the side of their material wealth. Because that's what, you know, that's what they're spending a lot of their time doing, you know, going to 40 hours a week or whatever, they're establishing more and more material wealth. And if they're successful in that, they'll be very materially wealthy whereas the monk is spending that time to develop their spiritual wealth. So when they, when you're talking about in terms of meditation or virtue or ethics or, you know, sp spirituality, the monk is in that place of authority and, and the, the kind of guiding person in that relationship. But from the other side, uh, in terms of material stuff, anything that you can imagine, the lay person is in kind of the position of authority. And that's a, that's a dynamic that happens a lot. So this is a, a letter that Master Yan Tao, this monk, sent to fundraiser Zhang. So probably someone who organized fundraisers for that organization, for that temple. <clears throat> so we can all listen deeply. Master Yan Tao said, Generally, teaching should let three statements flow out from desirelessness. But these are theory. Chewing away at it, chewing on it. When you want it to go, it doesn't go. When you want it to stay, it doesn't stay. Sometimes it just doesn't go at all. Sometimes it just doesn't stay at all. How true these words. Since ancient times, Zen teachers with great perception all had something to say, whereby they overturned the heavens and shook the earth. Where they were inaccessible, it was impossible to stay with them. Where they were ordinary and factual, it was impossible to get a hold of them. In their going against and going along, it was impossible to see them. This is called the grip of a patched-robed monk. My teacher's teacher, Yuan Wu, used to tell students, If I have a statement to reach you, I get a beating. If I have no statement to reach you, you fall into hell on your own. See how he had something to say. He was just like a golden-winged Garuda striking the sea and directly grabbing dragons to eat. Garuda, like this uh, mystical beast. If those who occupy the chair as teachers do not have the eye to capture tigers and rhinos and distinguish dragons from snakes, they will be swallowed up by the awakened. Since it is called the school of the source, it is just like this. 
Have you not seen how when Ming Zhao came to Elder Dan's place in Guan province? Dan said, When studying, you should go where there is even where there is even one person. Where there is even half a person, you should go. You should still go. When studying, you should go where there is even one person. Where there is even half a person, you should still go. Ming Zhao then asked, Where one person is there, I don't question. What is it like where there is half a person? Dan said nothing. Later he sent an acolyte, uh, an assistant, to question Ming Zhao. Ming Zhao said, Do you want to recognize where half a person is? It's just someone playing with a ball of clay. I thought Ming Zhao had seen an adept and must have a saying to startle people. How is it that he made a wild dog's cry? But tell me, where is the angle? So that's one Zen reading. That's Anyone have any thoughts about that? Yes. Um, one Great. of the passages that I thought was really interesting was he who something like he who will not see tigers and rhinos and distinct dragons and snakes will be swallowed by the awakened. Um, I just found that interesting. Maybe some elaboration on that line. Well, I can... Yeah, I can share my position on that. Um, so the line is, uh, this is a, it starts with a statement from Yuan Wu. So it says, my teacher's teacher, Yuan Wu, used to tell students. So this great monk from the past that was my teacher's teacher used to tell uh, his students if I have a statement to reach you, I get a beating. So maybe we can say if I am attached to some statement in reaching you, uh, this is an error. This is a point of attachment. So you're going to get a beating. You're going to make an error. Any action that's made out of attachment is a little bit off track in, in some way. You should do only. You should do without attachment to a goal or an expectation. So that's my interpretation of it. If I have a statement to reach you, I get a beating. If I have no statement to reach you, you fall into hell on your own. So, I mean, I interpret that as we're all probably going to go to hell. So if I don't have any statement to reach you, then you won't have a statement to bring with you to hell. We're all going to encounter difficulty. We're all going to continue making these mistakes that put us into difficult situations. So one way or another, we're going to hell. Uh, but it's a matter of how we, how we are carrying ourselves with sincerity and goodness and awareness that we can manage that skillfully. You know, there, there's that saying that if you find yourself in hell, you know, if you're walking through hell, well, you just better keep on walking. But if we are crippled, if we are weighed down by our attachments and our bad deeds and our unskillfulness, well, we're going we're gonna to stay in hell for a while. See how he had something to say. He was just like a golden-winged Garuda striking the sea and directly grabbing dragons to eat. Well, this might, that might have been a little bit of a different one. 
than what you mentioned. Not sure if that, uh, yes, okay. So if those who occupy, that was the one before, the line before. If those who occupy the chair, well, let me say this about the Garuda. So in uh, Buddhist mythology or in Buddhist stories, there's a there's an idea about a Garuda bird, a bird that's wings are so so big that when the the bird flies, when the bird comes out, you know, once every century or a thousand years or something, when that bird comes up, flies over the sky, its wings are so wide that it covers up the entire sun. It covers up all of the light that comes from the sun. And so this is kind of representing that one way or another, there's a Garuda bird that's going to come into your life and going to cover up the sun of your general peace, generally getting what you want, generally being healthy, generally your life meeting your expectations. Maybe it's an accident, maybe it's a, a person, maybe, you know, whatever it is, something's going to show up in your life that just covers up the sun of your wisdom, of your understanding, and you're going to have to know how to manage that. Um, moving on to what you brought up, uh, Gabe. If those who occupy the chair as teachers do not have the eye to capture tigers and rhinos and distinguish dragons from snakes, they will be swallowed up by the awakened. So my understanding about this is that if those people who are putting themselves to be in the position of a teacher cannot make clear distinctions on a case-by-case -case basis about this person is a snake, this person is a dragon. Because a dragon and a snake could look very similar, right? But maybe in the, in the general scheme of things, dragons are kind of like uh, representing great wisdom, and a snake is maybe representing something that's more selfish or nefarious, or snake certainly is not a dragon. Um, tigers and rhinos distinguish dragons from snake. So if someone who is occupying the chair as a teacher cannot make clear distinctions about each case being how it is, then they're going to be swallowed up by an awakened person. That means they're going to, their teaching is going to be secondary to someone who is awake and aware. You know, someone who is kind of restarting and refreshing at this moment. They're just going to be swallowed up by them because an awakened person is coming from this present moment. And if a teacher is not able to, to make those distinguish, it, to distinguish between tigers and rhinos, dragons and snakes, and is just kind of stuck in a rigid way of expressing their, you know, their teachings, which would be their attachments, then they're just going to be swallowed up by an awakened person, someone who is coming from a position of non-attachment and uh, just awareness. And I think that this is, you know, this, this really applies to our daily life as well. Um, if people are stuck in their attachments about the world and their perspective about the world, rather than seeing tigers as tigers and snakes as snakes and dragons and dragons, being able to, to distinguish moment by moment what's going on, then they're probably going to be making a lot of problems, but they are easily swallowed up by refreshing and restarting. You know, unskillful people, managers, people who put themselves in places of authority, they are easily swallowed up. They are easily digested and, uh, you know, swallowed up is a great way to say it, by someone who is awakened, by someone who is taking an approach from this present moment and is not relying on their, you know, their position, where they're coming from a, a position of attachment. So they're swallowed up. You don't, you don't cowtail. You don't kind of bow down. You don't follow someone just because they put them in the teacher's seat, unless they're really able to distinguish. You know, if they're they're able to see clearly about this is what's happening right now. Something like that. I mean, this is a this is one of those teachings. It's a little bit. 
um, it's a higher pay grade. Well, I don't know what, we don't know what it is. I mean, this is the thing is that you can say it's this or it's that, but we've just got to be able to distinguish dragons from snakes at any given moment. Otherwise, we'll just be swallowed up by awakened, someone who's awakened, someone who's willing to refresh and restart at this moment. So we should do the swallowing. We should be the ones who swallow um, those attached people, those confused percept um, confused perceptions. We should be the ones who refresh and restart, relying on uh, awakening rather than attachment. Thanks. Okay, so we'll we'll read another one here. This is a interesting one as well. So to missionaries Mu and Zian. I'm not exactly sure who wrote this, but it's some some monk from ancient times. The canonical teachings are not what the Buddha taught. The canonical teachings are not what the Buddha taught. So canonical teachings here means the, the ancient scriptures, the Buddhist Bible, all right, all of the original Buddhist texts. The canonical teachings are not what Buddha taught. Direct pointing to the human mind is not what great master Bodhidharma transmitted. So this is like the founder of Zen. And it's a, it's a common idea that like Zen is directly pointing to the human mind in the same way that it's a common idea that what the Buddha taught, that's the early, that's the Buddhist Bible, right? Those are the canonical teachings. So it's kind of a refutation of what people usually think of and, and feel about the way that things are in the Buddhist realm. So we'll start from the beginning again. The canonical teachings are not what Buddha taught. Direct pointing to the human mind is not what great master Bodhidharma transmitted. But these two expressions trouble all the patch-robed patch -robed ones in the world. So these two expressions trouble, confuse all of the, the monks, the sincere monks in the world. Seeking life, they cannot live. Seeking death, they cannot die. Just as they are hesitating, when they are suddenly spun around by someone and cut in two with a single sword stroke, blood pours on the highest heaven. Turning to take refuge in the Chan school, it means Zen, that's the original word for Zen is Chan, Turning to take refuge in the Chan school, they are still folks slurping foot-washing water. They still haven't even dreamed of our predecessor's meaning. They still haven't even dreamed of the Buddha's meaning. So, um, going back here, just as they are hesitating when they are suddenly spun around by someone and cut in two with a single sword stroke, Blood pours on the highest heaven. Turning to take refuge in the Chan school, they are still folks slurping foot-washing water. So just as we hesitate, and then we find ourselves falling into the greatest disaster, um, the greatest difficulty, as we're spun around and cut in two by someone's word or actions, blood pours on the highest heaven, great calamity, great disaster, then we turn to take refuge in the Chan school, or we turn to take refuge, especially if you're a monk or a very serious spiritual aspirant, practitioner, you turn to take refuge in the greatest wisdom that you can find. But you are still, they are still like folks slurping foot-washing water. So they've maybe turned in the right direction, but you're still just drinking the water from washing feet. They still haven't even dreamed of our predecessor's meaning, of the Buddha's real meaning. Haven't you seen how Linji, a famous monk, these are both famous monks, 
Haven't you seen how Lin Ji asked Huang Bo the precise meaning of Buddhism three times? All right, so Lin Ji and Huang Bo are very, very famous monks in the Zen tradition, the Chan tradition, going back throughout history. Haven't you seen how Lin Ji asked Huang Bo the precise meaning of Buddhism three times? So Lin Ji asked Huang Bo, what is the precise meaning of Buddhism? And so Huang Bo asked Lin Ji this. Haven't you seen how Lin Ji asked Huang Bo the precise meaning of Buddhism three times and was beaten, hitten three times? 60 strokes of the staff. Xing Hua studied with Lin Ji for a long time, then finally saw Dai Zhao. When he was taking off his patch robe, he was suddenly greatly enlightened and personally saw the meaning of Lin Ji getting beaten by Huang Bo. If you want to, if you want to succeed to the way of this school of Zen, if you want to succeed to the way of Zen, there has never been any other technique and no special mumbo jumbo. Just straightening the spine. When you get beyond, then you thread the nature and life of everyone in the world with a broken string. No one slips out of the net. Isn't this a great person doing the work of great people? So I'll, I'll read the last paragraph again and we can see if anyone has something to share. If you want to succeed to the way of this school, there has never been any other technique and no special mumbo-jumbo, just straightening the spine. When you get beyond, then you thread the nature and life of everyone in the world with a broken string. No one slips out of the net. Isn't this a great person doing the work of great people? Okay, anyone? Maybe I could share my understanding of the first part. All right, let's let's hear about your understanding. Okay, um, the way I understood it is that when you are looking and searching and searching, you're only going to get more looking and searching. You're like chasing will-o'-wisps. And um, what the Buddha taught is to be still and um, sort of like the previous passage. Um, to be present and aware. So um, that's kind of my interpretation. The second part was a little bit more um, confusing for me. <laughs> so maybe you just get lost in the web of life if you are um, trying to do anything at all. <laughs> but that's my understanding. <laughs> Great. Anyone else? Whatever understanding we have, that is just fine. As long as we are unwilling to attach to that understanding. So...
make sure that you have a unwillingness to attach, to hold on to, to fixate on your understanding, whatever that might be. All right, so we'll read one final story and then we'll uh, we'll wrap up with a little bit of a chant, a little bit of a performance, okay? So final story that we're going to uh, to read here. We have one question. Um, Jen, two questions from Jen Wallace over on YouTube. Jen says, uh, so he's saying that the Pali Canon isn't attributed to Lord Buddha. Um, no, he's saying that the Pali Canon is not the mind of the Buddha. Uh, Jen Wallace, or is not the enlightenment of the Buddha. Jen Wallace also asked the question, do you think beating someone with 60 lashes is a good thing? Bhante, can you clarify this? Um, it's a matter of waking people up. And um, it's very case by case. You know, it's not a policy. It's not a policy of beating people. But, you know, there's a story of a, a young monk who was staying at a, a monastery, a temple with like an enlightened monk. And this young monk would see the enlightened monk going around. And every time that that enlightened monk was asked a question, he would hold up one finger. This was his response. And it was an enlightened response. It was a response that came from a place of enlightenment. So this young monk said, aha, that's how I will answer questions. So he eventually went to, traveled around, went to another temple, another place, and showed to... Um, to someone else, this, uh, this someone asked him a question, or well, let's say he didn't go to another temple. Let's say that he stayed at that temple, and eventually the enlightened monk asked him a question. And that young monk who had seen the way the enlightened monk was answering held up a finger. Well, that enlightened monk chopped off, right in that instant, he chopped off that monk's finger, that young monk's finger. And guess what happened? that young monk became enlightened. So what a great, wonderful, compassionate action. My goodness. What? Hey, take all 10. Take, take all 20. I mean, enlightenment, that's, uh, that's not a cheap, you know, that's a cheap price. Take my fingers and my toes for enlightenment. Uh, so it's really a case-by-case -case basis of acting out of great compassion and great wisdom. And also there's this, uh, you know, what, what kind of questions do people ask? People usually ask superfluous, silly, vague questions because the way that we tend to live our lives tends to be surface level and vague and, and insincere at times, right? Because that's what's easy. It's easy to eat fast food and listen to music and watch YouTube. And that's not directing us towards this place of great wisdom, great sincerity, and great compassion in general. So when someone comes up and asks a question like that, well, what better to do than give them a, a bump on the head? Um, at least in this case, in ancient China, you know, these are all monks interacting with each other and a bump on the head is the, the least of your worries back then. I mean, try to find a hot shower, you know, try to, try to find shampoo. So, um, that's what I have to say about that, but no, physical abuse is not, is not really what this is talking about or being rough with people or being tough with people. But when we really are emanating wisdom and emanating compassion and emanating loving kindness, then a bump on the head might be, a, 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 um, you know, an action of great loving kindness and compassion. You know, a shout might be an action of great compassion and loving kindness. So case, case by case basis. All right. So remember here in this final letter uh, that Chan is the original word for Zen. So I know that Zen is the, the main word that people know here in America, um, but Zen is uh, the later changing of that word from Chan in China when Chan went to Japan. So Chan is really talking about a more original form of this school of Zen. So Zen Buddhism, Chan Buddhism. 
So this was a letter sent to the missionary Jian. The capacity of outstanding people in Chan communities is extraordinary. Wherever they go, they never communicate at random. Even a single word they may utter, even half a phrase, invariably has a reason. If they have some understanding that is not yet thorough, they accept correction from others. It is precision and clarity of knowledge that makes them that way. It is only the willfully blind who blabber at random, without question of right or wrong, only caring that people say they know how to give answers. They don't know this is business that squanders capital. When Yang Shan was with Bai Zhang, he was very loquacious. Loquacious means talkative. Bai Zhang said, You'll meet someone later on. So Yang Shan, this young monk or aspirant or person, with, was with this other monk, famous monk Bai Zhang, and he was very, very talkative. And Bai Zhang said to him, You'll meet someone later on. You know, saying like maybe this is not the right time, or I I don't ha I'm not I don't have this kind of way of relation to be involved with your talkativeness. You'll meet someone later on. Subsequently, he came to Guishan. Guishan said, "When you were with Bai Zhang, you gave ten answers for every question. Is that so?" Yang Shan said, "I do not presume." Guishan said, say something beyond Buddhism. As Yang Shan was about to open his mouth, he was driven out with shouts. So he was shouted out of the room. Questioned like this three times, three times he was shouted out as he was about to answer. Yang Shan hung his head and wept. He said, my former teacher told me I would meet someone later. That is what happened today. Henceforth, he became determined and went into the mountains and looked after oxen for four years. One day, Guishan went into the mountains and saw him sitting meditating under a tree. He poked him in the back with his staff. Yang Shan turned his head. Guishan said, Can you say yet? Yang Shan said, Even if I can't say, still I won't borrow someone else's mouth. Guishan said, You understand. This is what is called discerning the tune when the strings are set in motion, knowing it is autumn when the leaves fall. Perhaps, this is in parentheses, I'm adding this, perhaps knowing snakes from dragons, rhinos from tigers. Guishan found him in the forest after he went there to understand more deeply, poked him in the back with his, set, with his staff. Yangshan turned his head. Guishan said, Can you say yet? Yangshan said, even if I can't say, still, I won't borrow someone else's mouth. Guishan said, you understand. This is what is called discerning the tune when the strings are set in motion, knowing it is autumn when the leaves fall. As for Lin Ji, when he was with Huang Bo, he was severely beaten three times. Later, when he appeared in the world, he told the assembly, When I was caned at my former teacher's place, it was like being brushed with a sprig of mugwort. 
Mug- mugwort is a plant of the daisy family that is uh, very aromatic and pleasant. Whenever you bring up successors, it must be like those two great elders. Only then is it possible to make the school flourish. But when Lin Ji and Yang Shan became enlightened, what was accomplished? If you can find out, I will allow you have entered the Dharma door of the letter A. How mysterious, how wonderful. So let's uh, all bring our hands together and we'll just finish uh, with... Uh, some some Buddhist chanting. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Okay, so thank you all so much for joining in this meeting. I am so inspired by everyone being here. And I hope that you are all inspired in your own way to continue practicing and investigating, you know, about Buddhism and meditation and goodness and and just to be open to question what's happening right now, uh, to refresh and restart, to begin again from this moment to detach and to restrain ourselves, to take steps back from unskillful activities, even though they might be pleasurable and enjoyable, but they're not good for us. So step back from those things. Don't do them so much, at least. And as well, do good things, you know, help other people. Uh, You can, you also, you can host a group event in the server when I'm traveling, when I'm busy Um, reach out, you know, call up a family member, call up a friend, ask them if they need anything. Be generous with your time, with what's precious to you. Try to help out. And um, let's keep practicing together. And and I hope that this space can continue to be a space for uh, practice and for waking up. All right? Thank you all. See you sometime again soon, I hope. All right. (laughs) Okay. Take care. Thank you, Bhante. Thank mm. you.